at number 10 today we have a true classic. A young girl was at home by herself with a dog while she was waiting for her parents to come home. The dog always slept by her bed and was there to protect her and help her feel secure. One night while she was in bed, she heard a dripping sound and she went to go and check the kitchen tap to make sure that it was turned off. When she got back into bed, she stuck her hand under the bed to feel the dog and he licked her hand and she went back to sleep. After hearing the dripping noise again, she went to inspect the bathroom tap before heading back to bed, sticking her hand down to check on the dog again. The dog licked her hand and she continued trying to sleep. After still hearing the dripping noise, she went to investigate even further and check every tap in the house. This time, she listened closely and followed the sound of the dripping to locate exactly where it was coming from. She realized that it was coming from the closet and when she opened it up, she found her dog who had been killed and realized that the dripping sound was his blood dripping on the floor. On the inside of the closet door was a note that read, humans can lick too. Yikes. At number nine today, we have a strong reminder to be careful of strangers. But before I get into this one, just a reminder to click that little thumbs up to like this video. One beautiful day in Southampton, New York, a woman stopped for gas on the way to pick up her daughter, but was in a bit of a rush. As she was filling up, a man approached her and explained that his car had died and asked the woman if she could give him a ride to East Hampton for an appointment. The woman agreed since this was the same area she was headed to anyway, and the man put his briefcase in the back seat and then ran to use the washroom before they took off. As he was in the bathroom, the woman realized the time and panicked about being late to pick up her daughter and ended up forgetting all about the man and leaving without him. When the woman and her daughter arrived at home and she saw the briefcase in the back seat, she realized she had forgotten about him and went to search for some identification in order to get his belongings back to him. When she opened the briefcase, all all that was in there was a knife and a roll of duct tape. Who knows what this man would have had planned, but I am so glad she forgot about him. In our number eight spot, we have a reminder to travelers to always be wary. Remember when we could travel? The good old days. Anyway, a man is traveling for business and goes to the lounge for a drink at the end of a long day. Another person approaches the man and offers to buy him a drink. He accepts the drink and this is the last thing he remembers before waking up. What the man didn't know is that the stranger is part of a very organized and highly skilled ring. When he wakes up, he finds himself in a hotel bathroom tub with his entire body submerged in ice. The man looks around and sees a small phone beside him and notices a note taped to the wall that tells him not to move, but to call 911. Once on the phone with 911, the operator asks him to slowly reach behind him to see if he can feel a tube coming out of his back. When the man answers yes, the operator tells him to remain still and the paramedics are on their way. What the man doesn't know, but the operator does, is that the man has had his kidneys harvested. I remember hearing this in elementary school and never wanting to travel anywhere again. Coming in at number seven, we have another one of the most classic creepy stories that I remember telling people when I was a kid. A teenage couple drives out to the secluded makeout hill for some time alone. When they arrive, they throw on the radio to listen to some music and begin smooching. After a little while, the music stopped and a news announcer came on the radio. They said that a convicted murderer had just escaped from an asylum and to be on the lookout. The man would be easy to spot as he had a hook for a hand. The couple realized that the asylum was not very far from where they currently were, which made the girl feel very uneasy and she asked to head home. The boy reassured her and told her that he would lock all the doors and that they would be safe and tried to continue kissing her. Like any sane person, the girl pushed him away and insisted that they head home now. The boy finally obliges and speeds off in a rush. When they arrive at the girl's home, she gets out of the car and reaches for the door before letting out a blood curdling scream. When the boy comes around to see what she's screaming at, he sees a bloody hook dangling from the door handle. For number six today, we've got one that sends a chill down your spine. While this specific story isn't true, it is based on a story that unfortunately 
is true. There was an elderly couple who had been married for over 50 years and were so close that they joked about being able to hear each other's thoughts. Unfortunately, the woman fell ill and after a couple days of being in a coma, she passed. Her husband was of course terribly upset over the loss of his life partner and had to be pried away from her. He became very distraught and began insisting that his wife was still alive. Even after she had been buried, he begged for her body to be exhumed, saying that he had visions and dreams of her trying to get out of her coffin. After this went on for a while, they finally agreed to dig up the coffin in order to give this man some peace of mind. But when they opened up the coffin, to everyone except for the man's surprise, they saw the bloody scratch marks all over the inside of the coffin and the woman's fingernails were bent backwards. Maybe they really could hear each other's thoughts. Either way, they definitely should have listened to him sooner. At number five today, we've got a story of two college roommates who were in the same science class. One of the roommates, who we'll call Kim, was more of a partier, while the other one, who we'll call Jessica, tended to be more quiet and studious. One night before a science test, Kim got invited out to a party by a boy she liked, so instead of preparing for the exam, like Jessica, she went out to have some fun. Kim came home super late from the party and decided not to wake Jessica. She was nervous about the exam, but she knew she could ask all of her questions in the morning before the class. Morning came quickly and Kim got out of bed, only to see Jessica sleeping soundly on her stomach. Kim went to wake her up, when she saw that Jessica's study materials were still on the bed beside her, but were covered in blood. Kim, of course shocked at the murder scene she was standing in front of, fell to the floor. When she looked up, she saw written on the wall in Jessica's blood, aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? At number four today, we have a true story that was featured on the podcast, Radio Rental. A boy lived in a neighborhood that had five houses that were all close together that backed into a wooded area. All of the neighbors knew each other, except for one house that everyone referred to as the mystery house. The kids would make up stories of who they thought lived there or what they thought the house contained. One day, a boy went into the wooded area on his own to play with his GI Joes when he got an eerie feeling that someone was watching him. He decided to pack up and go home, but when he turned to leave, he heard a girl's voice say, you don't have to leave. He turned around to see a girl with messy mop top hair and a thick flannel shirt buttoned all the way to the top, which he thought was weird since it was the middle of summer. The two struck up a friendship and played together for the weeks to come. She explained that she lived in the mystery house and her room was the entire top floor, almost like an attic. The room had one window that looked out into the wooded area. After a while, the little girl just disappeared and stopped coming out to play. A few months passed and the mystery house went up for sale. The boy's family decided to go to the open house so that everyone could finally see what was inside and the boy went in hopes of seeing the little girl. The family met the couple that lived in the house and they explained that their daughter had passed away a few years prior. This made the boy's head spin as he had just played with the little girl a few months prior. Who had he been playing with? A few days later, he went back into the wooded area and looked up at the window that the little girl had explained was the window to her room. When he looked up, he saw the mother staring back at him, expressionless. It was then that he realized it had been the mother all along. In our number three spot today, we've got a story that is a pretty even mix of creepy and sad. There was a boy named Tom who was at school one day when he looked out the window and saw a photo laying in the grass. When the bell rang, he rushed out to grab the photo before anyone else could and saw it was a picture of a little girl doing a peace sign and smiling. He carried the picture home with him because he thought this little girl was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. When he arrived home, he showed the photo to his older sister and asked if she had ever seen the girl in the picture before. She said no and he was devastated because he so badly wanted to figure out who this girl could be. That night, in the middle of the night, he heard a tapping on his window followed by a little girl's <laughs> giggling. He grabbed the photo and began to investigate thinking that maybe this could lead him to his newfound crush. He continued following the giggling which eventually led outside and onto the road where he suddenly got hit by a car. When the driver of the car got out to help, he realized it was unfortunately too late. He saw the picture laying on the ground next to the boy and picked it up to see a beautiful little girl holding up three fingers. Coming in at number two, we have a classic hitchhiker story. This one starts off on an extremely stormy night. 
A man is driving down the highway just trying to make it to his destination safely when he sees a hitchhiker on the side of the road. Shocked that anyone would be hitchhiking in this bad of a storm, he figured that he must have been in a huge rush and pulled over to pick the man up. The hitchhiker got into the car and the pair took off. The hitchhiker was giving off weird vibes and was mostly silent for the ride, so the driver began asking him simple questions to get a conversation started and try and get to know the stranger that he had just picked up. The hitchhiker gave mostly one word responses and didn't really give away too much information about where he had been or where he was going. As they drove, the radio was playing a news show because the hitchhiker had mentioned he wasn't much of a music person. After several miles of travel, the news announcer on the radio said that there were reports of a patient escaping from a psychiatric institution. The hitchhiker quickly turned the channel saying that he hated the news. The driver didn't reply to this and the hitchhiker picked up on what the driver must have been thinking and said, don't worry, I'm not the killer, which is exactly what a killer would say. The driver replied with, no? And then quickly corrected himself by saying, of course you aren't. The driver continued to pry and asked what the hitchhiker did for a living. He revealed that he was a writer and was currently working on a book about a serial killer. The driver decided not to respond to this and just focus on the road and getting to where he could drop the hitchhiker off. The driver turned the news channel back on only to hear a new announcement that stated that they were getting more information on the escaped patient. They said his name was Simon Hughes and that he is extremely dangerous and unpredictable. They said that the patient had escaped by pretending to be one of the hospital staff and that he stole a car and drove off. This prompted the hitchhiker to ask the driver what his name was. The driver responded with, my name is Simon. What a plot twist. I honestly did not see that one coming at all. For our number one spot today, we have a story that really got me. This story starts off with a man describing an old apartment he used to live in with an annoying upstairs neighbor. The neighbor was a weird looking guy who always kept to himself, but every night around midnight, there would be a strange knocking noise coming from the upstairs apartment. It wasn't extremely loud, but because he was a light sleeper, it was extremely frustrating for him. Because of how often this happened, he started to realize that it was the same knocking pattern every time. Like a record playing over and over with the same amount of time in between each knock. He ended up moving out and moving past this neighbor. Several years later, the man was helping his daughter with her homework, where she was learning simple phrases in Morse code. She knocked one on the table and he instantly recognized this phrase as the same knocking pattern his neighbor had done all those years before. He of course had to ask her what it meant, and she just laughed and replied, it's the easiest one daddy, it's the one to call for help. Starting off this countdown we have the black hair girl. Now, this is said to be a very old Japanese story that has scared kids for generations and generations. So once upon a time, there was a poor samurai living in Kyoto with his wife. One day he gets visited by a wealthy man and he was like, come work for me. So he leaves his wife, works for this dude, and then gets with another woman and just leaves his wife all alone. Years later, he finishes his service for that dude and comes back and realizes he misses his ex-wife. So he heads on over to their old home and there she was, happily welcoming home. He fell asleep wrapped in her arms. But when he woke up, he discovered he was holding her cold, rotting corpse covered in her black hair. Turns out that his wife passed away many years before from sadness. Coming in the number nine spot, we have Kanabari Nayodo. This tale is known as the bald man, and it will make you close the blinds in every room in your home. The bald man is a tale people would tell to kids to remind them to lock their windows and keep their blinds shut. The story goes like this. The bald man was a big time creep. He would go from house to house and peer through people's windows to try and see them naked. This was the favorite pastime of this peeping Tom. Eventually, he was caught, and it was discovered that he'd been doing this for quite some time. His family disowned him, and as a punishment, his head was shaved bald. Now this marked weirdo had nowhere to go, and he was forced to live out in the mountains in a self-made hut. While secluded, his urge to peep on people only grew, and one day he returned to the village to try and kidnap someone. In the attempt, he was killed, but it turns out perverts never die. His ghost lived on and said that people will see a bald phantom in a white kimono that will spy on people when they're naked. Someone please call the Ghostbusters. I have some creepy ghosts spy on me while I'm on the toilet. No kidding. It's making it very hard for me to uh -huh. go. Well, just uh, just give me the address. We got one! 
And guys, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and hit the little notification bell and stick around until the end of this list because we're gonna be shouting up some comments from our collab video, Top 10 Deadly Climate Change Predictions. So stay tuned. Coming in at number eight, we have eight feet tall. This story has to do with a creature known as Hashishakusama. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. It was very hard. Basically, this creature is super thin and tall, standing at eight feet. Feet tall. Now she appears to be an attractive woman on the outside, but she is far from being human. This creature is known to trick and abduct kids. It is said that anyone who sees her is doomed to die in the next few days. She is said to have long black hair and is typically seen wearing a white summer dress paired with a wide brimmed hat, so she's quite fashionable. In fact, she tends to attract children by comforting them and making herself seem like a trustworthy adult. People also say that she can mimic the voice of their parents to also try to trick the children. But don't be fooled, for if you do, you will be killed by her evil wrath. Coming in at number seven, we have Beto Beto San. You know that creeping feeling you get when you're walking around late at night and you're all alone? Sometimes you peek over your shoulder because you're convinced that someone is looking at you or following you. You can't shake this feeling. Then it seems like you hear someone behind you walking. Well, that is Beto Beto-san. This is the Japanese ghost that will follow you when you're alone at night. You can hear his footsteps, but then when you turn around to look for it, there's no one there. Now, if you ask me, this sounds like a terrifying ghost. Something that stalks you in the night when the only thing protecting you is a dim street light and the shriek that will come out of me when I realize that there's something behind me. But in Japan, Beto Beto-san is actually considered cute. If you're walking alone at night and you hear some steps behind you, you're supposed to say Beto Beto San Okasini Okoshi. And this translates to Beto Beto San, please pass in front. There's even a statue of him around certain cities and it says you can leave coins in his mouth for good luck. In our sixth spot, we have the purple mirror. This story surrounds a young girl who is obsessed with her appearance. So much so that she spends her days just staring at herself in the mirror. That's all she cared about. But while doing so, she became really malnourished and gaunt looking. But all she saw in the mirror was her beautiful self. Until one day she decided to paint the mirror purple. And that's when she saw what she truly looked like. In disgust, she smashed the mirror. Time passed on and on her 20th birthday, she got hit and killed by a car. As she was dying, her final words were purple mirror, purple mirror. After the funeral, a bunch of visitors were found dead under weird circumstances. They all died when they turned 20 and all were found dead with shards of purple glass by them. Good thing that I already turned 20 long time ago. <laughs> Coming in number five, we have Kokori-san. If you guys have watched my content before, you might know what I'm about to say. I don't mess with Ouija boards. I refuse to use them and they creep me out. And the Kokori-san is basically the Japanese version of a Ouija board. There are some key differences though. When you use a Ouija board, the intention is to contact someone from the spirit world, maybe a dead relative. And nine times out of 10, you end up in contact with some demon that will eat your heart. But with Kokori-sen, you're actually contacting a spirit of a trickster who is named Kokori-sen. This thing is like the captain planet of little trickster animals. This thing is part fox, part dog, part raccoon. And when you put them all together, it sounds like one of the cutest animals that has ever lived. But this is still a trickster god. It will come down and mess with you, and I don't need that kind of mojo in my life. And at number four, we have the Snake Woman. The Snake Woman is a Japanese legend about a weird creature with a body of a massive snake and a head of a woman. She's also got creepy snake eyes, a long snake-like tongue with fangs, and long black hair. It's said that this creature lurks the shores, waiting to pounce on innocent swimmers or fishermen. What she will do is trick them. She will pretend like she's drowning, and then when they go to save her, she will snatch them and drag them underwater. She also can paralyze her victims with her eyes and then use her tongue to suck out all their blood. This is used as a cautionary tale to warn children about swimming or going near water at night or by themselves. Coming in number three, we have Futo Kuchiona. If you know someone who doesn't eat a lot, but they still seem to gain weight, they might be Futa Kuchiona. The English translation of this creature is the two-mouthed woman. She is a woman who has been cursed with a second mouth on the back of her head that is never satisfied, that always needs to eat. Her front-facing mouth seems to be small and never eat. It's so small and shy. The mouth on the back of her head, though, that thing is massive and drooling and constantly demanding more food, and it can use the woman's hair like long tentacles that grips food and slams it down the second mouth. 
if the woman doesn't eat, the second mouth will cause her pain. So she's kind of in a tough spot. How this creature came to be has a couple of different tales, but I think the one I like the best is about a man who remarries and his new wife doesn't like his daughter at all. Eventually, the man has a baby with his new wife, and every time she serves the two kids, she starves the one child who is not hers by birth. Eventually, that child dies. Then, one day, the dude is chopping wood and accidentally hits his wife in the head with an axe. That sounds a little sus if you ask me. The slash then turns into a mouth that constantly eats and is never full. This is the curse that is given to her for starving that poor child. In our second spot, we have the red crayon. This story begins with a newly married couple that moved into their first house together. One day, the husband was walking down the hall when he noticed a red crayon lying on the floor, which was weird because they didn't have any children, so he didn't know where the crayon came from. So whatever, he picked it up and tossed it into the trash. But the next day, he found another red crayon in the exact same spot. Finding this weird, he went and asked his wife about it. Apparently, she had also been finding red crayons in the exact same spot as well. So they both started inspecting the hallway. At one point, the husband began ripping the hallway wallpaper off the wall and noticed a room hidden there all boarded up. They then removed all the boards and that's when they found a small hidden room. Inside was their worst nightmare. Written all over the walls in red crayon was, I'm sorry, mommy, let me out. I'm sorry, mommy, let me out. Coming in at the number one spot, we have Oshiro Ibaba. All of us want to be beautiful, even the people who say they don't care about the way they look or that the way that others look. Deep down, there's an urge to be attractive. It's not a shallow thing, it's just a human thing. Well, Oshiro Ibaba, or the face powder demon, preys on this need for people to look good. She only appears on a cold night. She always has a walking stick and a large round hat that covers her face. She doesn't want you to see who she is because this might reveal the fact that she is a horrible demon. She looks for a young girl who might be wanting to look prettier. She preys on those of us with low self-esteem. Pretty rude if you ask me. When she finds a poor girl who craves the secrets of higher beauty, she will offer her some face powder, a secret blend that is supposed to make the girl even more beautiful than she's ever been before. The young girl can't resist, so she takes the powder and dabs some on her face. Well, that was a big mistake. The powder causes the girl's face to decay rapidly until there's nothing left but a skull. Then the Oshiori Baba takes the chunks of flesh that fell off the girl's face and uses them for nefarious things, <sighs> like more powder. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the single braid story. The road that runs along the campus of the Chinese University of Hong Kong is referred to as Single Braid Road, and this is the story that gave it that name. On a cold night, a girl with a long braid in her hair went to great lengths in order to sneak into Hong Kong from the mainland with her boyfriend. They boarded a train to head into the city when they saw police on the train checking people's identification. Because she wasn't supposed to be there and had snuck in, she decided the only thing to do would be to try and jump off of the moving train. In a gruesome turn of events, her braid ended up getting stuck in the window and ripped off all of the skin from her scalp and face. The girl stumbled onto the road where she collapsed and died. Throughout all of this, her boyfriend continued on the train, went into the city, got a new job, and pretended like the girl never existed. Flash forward to another night when a male student is walking alone on Single Braid Road when he sees a girl standing in the distance. He calls out to her, but she doesn't respond, so he begins to approach her and can see that she has a long braid in her hair. When he reaches her, he taps her on the shoulder, and when she turns around, he sees that she has no face. Then she just disappears. They say that the ghost has appeared many times since then, but only male students can hear her. I just want it to be known that if I was in her place and a boy did that to me, I would absolutely come back to haunt him and all men for the rest of eternity. Moving on to number nine, we have Room 111. And if you're liking this video so far, then make sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel because you know what? It really helps us out, so thank you very much. Now, much like most of these stories, this one has evolved over time, so there are two versions of the story. The one I'm about to tell you surrounds a very intelligent science undergraduate who thought he discovered how to master time travel. So one night in room 111 of Grace Tian Hall, he wrapped himself up in a mechanism he had created. It was a bunch of wires attached to an alarm clock and a big battery. When the clock's alarm went off, he believed he was going to be able to travel in time. But the experiment went terribly wrong, as you could have imagined. And he ended up being electrocuted to death. 
His roommate found him laying in bed with a note beside him reading, I will come back soon. Upon this discovery, the roommate went mad and had to be taken to a mental asylum. And now, no one ever dares to stay in room 111 for the events that happen there. In our number 8 spot today, we have the story of the hanged ghost. While ghosts are extremely common in Chinese folklore, these ghosts are pretty specific. A hanged ghost is a spirit of someone who is hanged, whether it be from committing suicide or execution, and they haunt the location where they died. While most ghosts are already pretty creepy, the hanged ghosts have quite an appearance. They are said to appear as a corpse with a long red tongue that hangs out of their mouth. The goal of these ghosts is to try and convince anyone they come across to join them in the afterlife. Making our way down the list, number 7, we have the Painted Skin. This story has to do with a demon that hides its true gruesome appearance by transforming into other people. So one day this man named Wang runs into this beautiful woman on the street that claims to be homeless. He takes her home and hides her in his house from his wife. And he has an affair with this mystery homeless woman. Well, eventually a priest warns him that there's evil in his house. But he ignores it. Until one day he looks into his window and sees the woman is actually a green faced monster with sharp jagged teeth. She had been wearing a mask made out of human skin. The story basically ends with the guy getting his heart ripped out by the demon and then the demon transforms into different people to hide his identity. In the climax the demon shows its true self and the priest beheads it with his wooden sword. And then Wang's wife just coughs up his heart and puts it back into Wang's chest and then he's brought back to life. Crazy, I know. Also, what kind of a bedtime story is this, really? Coming in at number 6, we have the Little Finger Story. There was a male university student who often found himself studying in the library late after it had closed. After his study session, he would walk past a park on his way back to his dorm, and he always saw a small little girl sitting on a swing in the park. One day he decided to go and speak to the little girl and check on her. From that night on, every time he passed the park and saw her there, he would stop in and chat with her before returning home. One day he was telling his friends about this little girl and they asked what she looked like. He described the girl and his friends told him that she sounded like she looked exactly like a teacher's daughter who had tragically died in a car accident, but that daughter had lost her little finger. The next night, when the man went to go and see the little girl in the park, he couldn't help but ask to see her hands, just to check. She was very reluctant, but he insisted. And when she finally revealed her hands, he saw that she was in fact missing her little finger. Of course this freaked him out, so he ran away in fear. From then on, he never saw the little girl again. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Mongolian Death Worm. The Mongolian Death Worm is a famous cryptid in China. It's said to lurk in the Gobi Desert and is described as being this giant red type worm creature. It's said to be between 2 to 5 feet long and is as thick as a man's arm. But the creature can grow even bigger than that. As a result of its appearance, it's sometimes called the intestine worm. On top of it all, it can also spray venom at its victims from a far distance. Its acid-like venom is so strong that it can kill a camel or horse. Now, many believe this creature is said to be true and have even gone to the desert in search of it. So far, it has come of nothing, and let's keep it that way. Moving on down to number 4 today we have the oxtail soup story. There was a young couple who were in medical school together. They lived in the same dorm but on different floors and there was a really strict study curfew that left them little to no time to see each other. It's also worth mentioning that this story comes from a time when there were no cell phones so they couldn't just slide into each other's DMs or have a quick FaceTime in order to catch up. Every night the girl would make oxtail soup and because her boyfriend lived directly below her, she would send a cup of soup down from her window. They both loved this little tradition that they had set up and it made them feel close even when they couldn't speak or see each other. So one night the boy received his soup, ate it and then fell asleep studying. The next day he had time to go up and see his girlfriend so he headed to her floor but he couldn't find her. He ended up asking around and came to find that his girlfriend had actually died a few days before due to a sudden illness. He was of course suddenly overwhelmed with grief and the terrible news but then it quickly hit him. If his girlfriend had died a few days ago, who had given him the soup the night before? In 
three, we have the hopping corpse. The Jiangxi, otherwise known as the Chinese zombie or the Chinese hopping vampire or the hopping zombie is a pretty well-known creature of Chinese folklore. This creature's name translates to rigid bodies or stiff corpse, and it's said to be corpses that have come back to life to kill the living. They are described as having greenish rotting flesh and move by hopping. You'll know when one's coming if you hear thump, thump. Thump. That's the sound of the monster hopping to get you, to suck the soul out of you like a vampire. In order to scare off these creatures, you need to use mirrors because they are scared of their own reflections. And also, they don't like the brightness of mirrors. For some reason, a hopping zombie is way scarier to me than one that limps slowly. I don't know what it is about it. In our number two spot today, we have the Lotus Pond story. This story starts off with a young couple who were so in love that they planned to run away together and elope. They made a plan to meet at midnight at the Lotus Pond and from there they would leave and go start their lives together. When the girl showed up at midnight, she waited for so long but the boy never showed up. She left the pond and went back into town when she spotted her boyfriend with another woman. She was so heartbroken and upset that she began crying and could not stop. She was so distraught that she went back to the Lotus Pond where they had planned to meet and drowned herself. Months later, another couple had planned to meet at the Lotus Pond. The boy got to the pond early and was waiting for his girlfriend to arrive when he heard a female voice say, I asked you to meet me at midnight, didn't I? The boy was really confused because this wasn't the meeting time that him and his partner had discussed and he responded, no. All of a sudden, two pale white hands reached out of the water and dragged him under the pond, drowning him. Ever since then, it is said that if you are at the Lotus Pond at midnight and you encounter a girl or hear her voice, do not answer her questions or even look at her, or she will get you too. And in our number one spot, we have Bus 375. On midnight of November 14th, 1995, bus 375, the last bus of the night, pulled into Summer Palace's bus terminal. It was known as the Midnight Bus, or the bus to Fragrant Hills, because that's where the bus was headed. But on this night, the bus disappeared under mysterious circumstances. At the bus terminal, two passengers got on, an old man and a young man. While headed to the last stop, the bus driver spotted three shadows waving at the side of the road. The bus driver stopped and it was three men and he let them on. But something wasn't right about them and you couldn't see any of their faces. Shortly after the three people got on, the old man picked a fight with the young man, claiming he stole his wallet. The argument got so bad that they got kicked off of the bus. When they got off and the bus zoomed away, the old man was no longer angry and he told the young man that he had just saved their lives. The three passengers that got on were ghosts. He noticed that they didn't have any feet and that they were floating. The next day, the two learned that bus 375 vanished, only to be found three days later at the bottom of a lake. Inside the bus, there were three decomposed corpses. Now, some believe that this is a true story, and to this day, it remains an unsolved mystery. Coming in at number 10, we have The Stinky Cheese Man. Honestly, this is one of the best books ever written, but I don't know if it should be for kids. Basically, it's a series of children's stories that are known to be famous fairy tales, but they have been reworked to be very strange. Now, I loved this book when I was a kid, but that could be why I'm so weird now. You could read this book to your kid, but they might end up like me. The main story of this book is called The Stinky Cheese Man. It was basically the story of a gingerbread man, but instead of people trying to chase him down to eat him, they can't stand the smell of him because he's made of the stinkiest cheese. So he thinks everyone is trying to chase him down and eat him, but in reality, no one can stand him. It's the perfect representation of someone who thinks they're great, but has no idea what's going on in the real world. The one I remember the most of the Stinky Cheese Man versions was The Ugly Duckling. The Ugly Duckling, if you guys know that story, starts out as an ugly duckling, grows up to be a beautiful swan. In the Stinky Cheese Man version, starts out as an ugly duckling, and then he grows up, and it turns out he was just an ugly duck. I remember that one so vividly because my mom would read it, and she couldn't finish reading it, because the last line when it says, turns out he was just ugly, she would laugh so hard. She'd be like, that it? and she could never finish the story because she thought it was the funniest thing on the planet. Coming in at number nine is Under the Bed. You best believe if someone told me this story when I was small, I would have gone and slept in between my parents. I don't even care. I did that till an extremely old age, which I will not say, 12, 
You get scared sometimes. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> now as the story goes, a young boy is just sleeping in his bed when he hears footsteps outside his door. Thinking he could be either a serial killer or just a random creak, he peeks at the door before it swings open. As the door opens, it reveals a crazed serial killer holding the dead bodies of both the boy's parents. Terrified and frozen watching him, the man put the parents on a chair and got some blood on his hands and wrote something on the wall. Now thinking the boy is asleep, the murderer hides under the bed. The boy at this point has probably peed and shat at this point and silently probably crying his eyes out and just every orifice on his body is, you know, releasing. Now it's too dark for him to read what the man wrote, so he just pretends he is asleep and lays as still as possible. Just imagine it's dead silent and the boy can just hear the killer breathing underneath him. An hour passes and eventually his eyes are adjusting to the light and he finally makes out what the man wrote. Just as he hears a noise from under the bed, he reads the words, I know you're awake. <gasps> Death. Coming in at number eight, we have El Coco. This story has many names. Every culture has their version of El Coco. It's basically the boogeyman. Now, while most people wouldn't dream of telling their kid this kid's story in this day and age, it used to be a very classic story for kids. You would tell your child some sort of horrific tale about some beast that would steal them away if they misbehave, and then say goodnight. This would scare your kid into behaving. I mean, it's a tactic that probably worked, but the long-lasting mental stress you'd be putting on that kid would be some trauma that they would never get over and would probably stretch into the rest of their life. They would grow up very angry and never know that it was because of the story of El Coco that is actually floating around in the back of their head. You know, when I was a kid, I thought the Boogeyman was a dude who danced really well but was also scary. That's why they called him the Boogeyman. So I would picture this demonic beast grooving in my closet. I thought he would burst out to disco music and then take me down to this underground dance club where he would eat me alive. Filling on number seven slot is the smell. Once upon a time, as it always is once upon a time. There was a married couple that fought a lot. They were just starting to talk about getting divorced when the wife found out she was pregnant and so the couple decided to stay together for the baby. Honey, even those marriages never work out. Never stay together just for the baby. But by the time the boy turned five, the couple were fighting non-stop and shit was bad. One night the fight got really bad and the dad was so angry he choked his wife to death. In a panic, he quickly took the body to the boot of the car before the son could wake up and find out that his dad has murdered his mom. He got to a swamp, kind of piggybacked the body over his shoulder and then threw it into the gross ass swamp. It smells horrible and because he had been in the water, the husband also stank like sh**. When he got home, he showered straight away, but the stench stayed. Days passed and the smell wouldn't go away and the boy kept asking where his mum was. Eventually, the dad said she was staying with relatives and that was the end of that. But then, any time he would approach his son, the boy would be terrified, backing away if the dad ever stepped close to him. One night, he asked him if there was something he wanted to say to him about his mother and the boy replied, why is mommy's face so pale? The dad was like, what do you mean? And the boy answered, why do you give her a piggyback every day? Day. Damn, so the boy can see the mom. Nope. Anyways, the next one is number six, the Ouija board. It should be no surprise that there's a spooky bedtime story that involves a Ouija board. In fact, this would be something I would tell my imaginary kids if I ever had them. They need to learn from an early age that if you mess around with spooky things, bad stuff will happen. I don't need my kids bringing that kind of bad energy into my life. Well, this story follows along a group of kids who got the bright idea of using a Ouija board to try and talk to some dead people and then things go terrible terribly wrong. Everyone gets cursed and one by one each one of the kids dies off because of some horrible demonic force that kills them. Honestly, the whole thing sounds like a bad time. But why would you tell this story to kids? Well, back in the early 20th century, the fear of the occult was much more serious than it is now. Now when you say the occult, you think about a few girls sitting around a circle with some crystals and a birth chart. But back then, you thought the devil himself was going to use his followers to breed a dark army. So this story would envelop kids with fear so they they would stay far away from the dark arts. Coming in at number five is the voice. It's always the big houses that end up scarring kids for life. Now when this kid was young, his family moved into a two story house, which was honestly a bit of a maze. Both his parents worked, which meant he'd often come home from school to an empty house, which is scary as a kid. I remember that happened to me for a period while my sisters were in uni, and I was scared home alone every single day. I would just be like cocooned in the like blanket and just wait there until somebody got home. Either way, one evening he came home after being at a friend's and the house 
house was dark. He called out for his mum and he heard her response from upstairs, so obviously he went running upstairs to find her. He called out for her again and heard her say yes, so he narrowed it down to one of the rooms on the far right side of the house. The kid was still a bit scared, but he knew as soon as he saw his mum he'd feel safe, so he rushed to the room and just as he was about to open it, the front door opened. He heard his mum shout, sweetie, are you home? Which is like, okay, if that's my mum, who the hell answered me in this room? The boy immediately let go of the door handle and ran down the stairs. As he was going down, he looked back briefly and saw something staring at him from the crack of the door that was open. Note to self, just don't don't open that door ever. Coming in at number four, we have the Lorax. This is a Dr. Seuss story that I would get read all the time as I was going to sleep. If you don't know the whole story of the Lorax, it's that of a forest dweller who used to live in a lush green world that was covered by nature and then slowly but surely the entire forest is torn down and all that is left is smog and rot. Everything that used to be green and healthy is now dead and the story is a warning to everyone that we should stop destroying the environment or it's going to get eaten up faster than Joey Chestnut chomps down a meal. Now, on second thought, even though this story seems too real now and very frightening, it probably should be told to all children so they learn that we need to take better care of the planet or we're going to have to start eating each other like Joey Chestnut eats any. slot is the keyhole. We've all had variations of the scary story as kids, but I always thought it was super creepy. So this man's flight lands quite late, and so he drives to this tiny hotel a few miles outside of Kiev. He tells the concierge he wants to book a room, and she does all the admin stuff and gives him the key and the room number. Now just as he's picking up his luggage to go up, she tells him, but one more thing, comrade. There's one room without a number, and it's always locked. Don't even peek in there. Too tired to even take her warning seriously, the guy shrugged it off and went to his room. He passes the hell out but is awoken in the middle of the night by the sound of a running tap. But hella annoyed, he follows the sound and realizes it's coming from the room opposite his, which is the one that the concierge warned him about. He starts pounding on the door to try and get the person to stop, but no one answers. The man then looks into the keyhole and sees nothing but red. The water's still going and so he's had enough. The flight was long enough. He's been through enough sh so he goes downstairs and complains to the concierge. After finishing, he asks, by the way, who is in that room? And that's when the truth finally came out. She explained how there was a couple that used to board that room where the husband ended up murdering his wife. She was a pale white beauty, but her eyes were always fully red. I don't know, but you know what you just saw in the keyhole is his eye. Coming in at number two, we have the 13th floor. I mean, it's almost Halloween, so it should be no surprise that we have a good Halloween story for you. The bedtime story of the 13th floor is one where a couple of kids go to a haunted house that is an entire apartment building. Each floor is more spooky than the last. The two kids keep climbing higher and higher, but they are warned that you should not go to the 13th floor. Whatever horrors are waiting for you up there, they are too intense for some someone to handle. Well, they manage to work their way up and they're at the doorway of the 13th floor. One of the two kids is too scared and turns back, but the other one marches on alone. The next day at school, the one kid who turned back is looking everywhere for their friend, but they can't find them. Eventually, they ask someone, do you know where Matt is? And they respond, who's Matt? They ask a few more people, but no one remembers Matt, as if they were erased from history. And finally, animal one is the ribbon. I love ribbon stories. There's so many variations of this one. One of them actually includes the pirate Blackbeard, but this is not the one I'm talking about. Now, long, long ago, a pretty girl went to school and she had a lovely green ribbon tied around her neck. At school, she made a friend called Jim who sat behind her in class. He noticed the ribbon pretty quickly and casually asked her why she wears the ribbon around her neck and her reply was quite vague. All she said was, someday I'll tell you. Now, years went by and the tween turned into teens and Jim asked her out on a coffee date. The date went obviously great since they'd been friends for years now and again Jim asked her about the ribbon and this time she said, well maybe if we ever get married I'll tell you. Fast forward many many years, you can well imagine what happened. The two got married, were happier than ever and again he asks, 
We're married now. Why do you wear that ribbon on your neck? And she says, I'll tell you if we ever have kids. At this point, I would be like, are you cheating on me? Why are you not telling me about this? I've literally married you. Years later, they have a baby girl and boy. And again, he asks her. And all she said is, if you love me, you'll drop it for now. Someday, I'll tell you. All Jim knew was this girl. She was his life. And he loved her more than anything. So he just stopped asking. The duo finally grew old together. And when at last, his wife was on her deathbed, he asked, please tell me now, why do you have that ribbon around your neck? And with her last breath, she said, okay, I'll tell you, take it off now. And he did. And as soon as the bow was loose, her full on head fell off. Starting us off this countdown, we have the black curtains. This story will teach you to always listen to your mother. So once upon a time, there was a mother, father, little girl, and her brother. One day, the mother entrusted her daughter with a task. She told her to go to the store to buy curtains. She said, whatever you do, don't buy black curtains. But what did the girl do? She ended up buying black curtains and then hung them up in her home. Well, that night, the black curtains choked her father to death. The next night, they choked her mother. The following night, they choked her brother. It wasn't until all three of her family members were dead when she decided to tell the police. Like, hello, wouldn't you have told them after the first death? Anyways, the police ended up hiding out in the girl's house, and when the curtain went to choke her at night, they shot at it. The curtains let out a sharp scream and oozed out black blood, and they died. So what can you take away from the story? Don't buy black curtains, listen to your mom, and uh, don't wait until the last second to call the authorities. Moving on to number eight, we have Liha. Liha can translate to bad luck. In Russian folklore, the Liha is a creature associated with evil and misfortune. It can either appear as an old skinny woman in black with one eye, or a creepy male goblin with one eye. But it's usually the latter. So there are a bunch of different stories surrounding this creature, each with different morals. In one version, a person cheats Liha, they run away from him, then they grab something valuable like gold or money out of greed, but their hands get stuck to it. So Liha comes to cut off their hands. In another version, Liha cheats the person and hops on his neck. The person wants to then drown Liha, so he jumps into a river, but he ends up drowning and Liha floats away safely. So there are many stories and versions of Liha, all meant to scare kids and teach them different lessons. Moving on to number seven, we have the Boginka. It is said that these female swamp demons are the souls of midwives, old maids, unmarried mothers, pregnant women who die before childbirth, or abandoned children born out of wedlock. They are depicted as these ugly, naked, limping creatures who are most dangerous for children. The creature is said to kidnap babies just after they're born and replace the child with its own children who are called changelings. The changelings were easily recognizable with their disproportionate bodies, usually with a huge abdomen abdomen and either unusually small or large heads, a hump, and really thin arms and legs. The changelings were obviously wicked creatures and were apparently very spiteful to all the humans around them. To protect the human baby from being taken by these creatures, the mother had to tie a red ribbon around its hand, put a little red hat on its head, and shield the baby's face from the moon. If the child was kidnapped, there is a chance to get it back. The mother would have to take the changeling to an old dump, whip it with a birch twig, and pour water from an eggshell on the changeling while saying, take yours, give me mine back. Eventually the creature would feel bad for her changeling and give back the human baby in exchange for the creature one. Making our way down the list at number six, we have the casket on wheels. And yes, it's just as horrifying as it sounds. It's legit a casket on wheels. Some of these caskets even have a propeller to help it move. So basically, this casket just roams the streets. If you do something wrong, then it will appear and haunt you. Once it starts haunting you, you are ultimately powerless. The coffin also has a voice that says things like, the coffin on wheels knows your town and is looking for your home. The coffin on wheels knows your home and is looking for your front door. The casket on wheels has already found your house and is now searching for your apartment. You get the idea. It does this to taunt you. No matter what you do, you can't escape it. The person in the story either gets dragged to hell by the coffin, mold to death by a monster in the coffin and then dragged to hell, or the person takes their own life. 
So, don't sin, or else you're gonna end up like one of those guys in hell. <laughs> In our halfway mark at number five, we have the Russian mermaids Rosalka. These mermaids hide at night in the lakes and riversides, waiting for people to walk by. If someone gets too close to the water, the mermaids will grab them and pull them down to the bottom where they tickle them to death. The mermaids also have a master called Vodyanoi, who is the spirit of water and looks like a weird frog creature thing. It is said that the master can ascend to the sky to create new bodies of water and can also drown people. The main target of him is girls who go swimming in the lakes after sunset. One of the creepiest parts about this is that he takes the prettiest girls that he drowns to be his wives. Moving on to number four, we have the Black Volga. This is a Russian legend that was also told to children at bedtime. But it wasn't just a popular story in Russia. No, it was also popular in Poland, Greece, and Hungary. That's how big this legend was. So during the 1960s to 1970s, there was a story going on surrounding a mysterious black Volga that was kidnapping people, mainly kids. Eventually, people started to believe that the devil himself was driving the car. Some even say the car didn't have side mirrors. Instead, it had horns on either side. To this day, some people believe the story to be real. Coming in at our number three spot, we have the Cochet, whose name is likely derived from the word for bone. He is basically a skeleton wrapped in very thin skin and resides in a limbo between life and death. He has magical powers and is immortal, and he usually ends up in stories with a lot of wealth. He is known for kidnapping young girls to make them his wives, which ends up leading the girl's human groom to try and battle and defeat Cochet in order to save her. His death is said to be at the end of the needle, the needle in an egg, the egg in a duck, the duck in a rabbit, and the rabbit in a trunk locked in chains hanging from the top of an oak tree. So basically it's not really easy to take him down. It is also said that he is blind, and in order to be able to see his enemies, he asks his servants to lift his his eyelids. And at number two, we have the Red Piano. This is a pretty famous Russian story, and it's pretty creepy too. Basically, it surrounds this little girl that received a piano as a present for her birthday. As it was delivered, they were told that if something happens to it, only one lady in town could fix it. It was just some old random lady. Anyways, the girl was so excited to finally learn how to play. After a couple weeks of playing, the girl complained to her parents saying her fingers hurt, but they told her it was normal because she just wasn't used to playing. She kept practicing, but the more she practiced, the more she grew thinner and paler. Then after a month, the piano broke, so they called up that old lady to fix it. Now, when she arrived, she told the girl and her parents to let her fix the piano in peace. She didn't want any distractions, so she shut the door and told them to leave her alone. A little while later, the piano was fixed and the girl continued playing. But as she played daily, she continued to grow sicker and sicker. Then the piano broke again. So the lady came in again to fix it. This time, the parents were curious, so they decided to peek inside through the keyhole and what they saw was horrifying. They saw the old lady open the piano and take out a glass jar filled with what looked like blood. Then she started to drink it. Turns out that the piano keys had tiny needles built into them, invisible to the naked eye. When the girl played the piano, the piano would cut her and drain her blood. Then the piano was designed to break when the jar was full so that the old lady could come in and drink the blood. I know, I know what you're thinking. How on earth is this a bedtime story? In our number one spot today, we have the Kikimoras. Kikimoras are evil spirits that usually remain invisible. While these creatures live pretty much anywhere, their favorite spots are in human homes because they love to create trouble. They like to poorly spin yarn and get the wool all tangled up. If they settle into your home, they'll give you nightmares, they'll break the things in your house, and they will even bother your pets. It is said that you can protect your home from them with juniper branches and sagebrush. If a kikimora decides to show itself to you, then you are bound to have some misfortune come your way very soon. One way the kikimoras travel is if a sorcerer places their spirit inside a ceremonial doll and throws it at the home of an innocent person. Coming in at number 10, we have Die Grishit von Bison Frederick. Our next story translates to either cruel or wicked Frederick. I think it depends on what era you're born in, but this story is pretty much about a sociopath in the making. The story starts with cruel Frederick running around 
killing birds, just random birds that he finds. He finds them and he kills them and he rips their wings off. And this isn't even to eat them. He just wants to kill them for his own sick pleasure. No, you need, you need help. I need help. Who does that? And the story only gets worse from there. He starts to destroy furniture and then he finds some poor lady named Mary and he starts whipping her. First of all, what is wrong with this kid? And second of all, why on earth does this kid have a whip? Who gives a kid a whip? Then there's a dog that shows up at this kid's house and he starts whipping the dog. And then the dog gets pissed and it mauls cruel Frederick's leg. And then the story ends with him in bed because his foot is infected and the dog is sitting at the dinner table eating his food. So I guess the moral of the story is don't be an evil child of Satan or you'll get attacked by wild animals and maybe starve to death. Eh? Next on the list we have Truel Peter. This story translates to Shaggy Peter. And while being Shaggy now in this day and age with ripped jeans and face tattoos is hip and cool, back when the story was written in 1845, they didn't feel the same way. Well, maybe that was just Germany. I don't know if there's a bunch of people running around with face tattoos in the 1800s in New England, who knows. But this story is about a boy who gets too damn shaggy. He never wants to groom himself. He has fingernails that grow super long and his hair needs to be brushed, but it's also so long because he never cuts that's it. Also, the story specifically talks about how he's covered in soot. I don't really think that's a problem anymore. I think the equivalent to being covered in soot is like being covered in Cheeto dust. The modern version of this story should be Cheeto dust Charlie and the sticky fingers that ruined his Xbox controller. Someone in the comments, please tell me how to say that in German. But pretty much what happens to old Shaggy Peter is that no one likes him. He stinks. He's hairy. He's got fingernails so long he could scratch his next door neighbor's ear holes. So the moral of the old tale is be clean or people won't like you. In 1840, we hadn't started telling kids that it's what's on the inside that counts. You're ugly. Coming in at number eight, we have Fidgety Phillips. This story is a warning to kids who can't sit still at the dinner table. But before I dive into this one, don't forget to like this video. The story goes that young Philip is at the dinner table with his parents and is being pretty rambunctious. Eventually, after moving around way too much, he ends up tipping his chair over. In his fall, he ends up bringing the entire dinner table and everything on it down with him and makes a complete mess. He is under the tablecloth with all of the dinner scraps over top and all around him. His parents are of course extremely upset at him for ruining all their plates and glasses and the dinner that they had made for everyone. The boy ended up not getting to eat dinner and had to go hungry that day. If you take anything from this story, just make sure you're minding your manners at the dinner table. Moving on to our number seven spot, we have the story of Augustus who wouldn't have any soup. This story is about a boy named Augustus who was a healthy little boy with round cheeks. Augustus never had a problem eating and and also ate whatever he was told to and never let his soup get cold. But one winter day, something changed in Augustus. When his soup was placed in front of him that day, he threw a tantrum and refused to eat it. He threw his spoon across the room and yelled to get that nasty soup away from him. The next day, he was visibly thinner from not getting his nutrients, but he still refused to eat his soup. The next day, the same thing and the days that followed. He was withering away in front of everyone's eyes. On the fourth day he was so thin he hardly outweighed a sugar plum. The story takes a dark turn on the fifth day when he ends up being found dead. And number six we have Die Grieche von Fleischenden Robert. This one is the story of Flying Robert. He goes out during a rainy day and he has his umbrella and he ends up floating away. And the last line of the story is literally he was never seen again. The moral of the story is to tell kids not to go outside when it's gross and rainy outside but how harsh does the story have to be. The kid couldn't just come home with a cold and get a little sick and then get better. No, he had to float away from the wind, picking him up by his umbrella, and then he would vanish from society. Jesus. In our number five spot, we have the girl without hands story. This story is about a father who gets offered money by a strange man. The man tells the father that if he gives him whatever is standing behind the mill, then he will give him the money. Unbeknownst to the father, this strange man is actually the devil. The man agrees because he believes that there is only an apple tree standing behind the mill, but to his unfortunate surprise, his daughter was actually standing behind it. When the devil goes to take the daughter away, she fights back. She is so pure that she is able to resist his grip, but the devil still wants to take something with him. He tells the father and daughter that he will leave if the father will chop 
lop off his daughter's hands to give to him. Of course, at first they said absolutely not, but then the devil threatened to take the father away if they didn't agree. So unfortunately, that father and daughter had no choice and were forced to chop off her hands. I definitely don't want to go to sleep after hearing that one. And number four, we have Digrishit von den Wilden Jaeger. Also, if I'm pronouncing these wrong, I want to apologize to everyone watching the video. This translates to the story of the Wild Huntsman. This is a tale about a dude who wanted to head out and hunt some rabbit for his dinner. While he was out hunting, the day gets super hot and this dude was like, why should I hunt in the sun when I can just take a nap and start hunting again later? Smart dude. Well, it turns out, not so smart. When he was sleeping, the rabbit steals his gun and his glasses and then starts shooting at him. He starts running away in terror because the rabbit is trying to kill him and he can barely see without his glasses. The huntsman manages to run back to his cottage where his wife is waiting for him. His wife hears a ton of commotion and comes out to see her husband being hunted by a rodent. In a final attempt to survive, the huntsman jumps down a well and his wife screams in terror and drops her coffee on her foot and burns herself and the rabbit and the rabbit's baby celebrate. I don't even know what the moral of the story is. Don't sleep on the job or animals will gain sentience and try to murder you in front of your loved ones? In our number three spot, we have Max and Moritz. This story is about two little rascals who like to pull pranks. In the story, they pull off seven different pranks. Some of their pranks include stealing a widow's chicken, breaking a bridge, and then making the tailor walk over it so that he falls into the river below, and filling a teacher's pipe with gunpowder so that when he lights it, it blows up in his face. Needless to say, these boys are pretty reckless and pretty cruel. Eventually, someone decides it's time to prank the boys back, but this is where things take an even darker turn. This prank ends up being less of a prank and more of an extremely severe punishment. The boys end up getting baked into bread and fed to the chickens. I can't believe that this is actually a story told to children. The boys did play some pretty harmful pranks, but I'm not sure if this extent was necessary. I guess it's a lesson to be kind and treat others well. At number two, we have Daigo Torre Grishitimi Friorzig. There's my German, I'm killing it. <laughs> killing it at German today. My German's the best. This translates to a very sad story with matches. And it's about a girl named Harriet who's left home alone. Her parents have a box of matches on the countertop and tell her not to touch them, but this little girl loves fire. And so the girl doesn't listen to her parents and she lights a match anyways. And then her clothes light on fire and she burns until there's nothing left but her smoldering ashes on the ground. And then her cats cry a stream of tears out of their face and that's the end. That's the end of the story. The lesson is obviously don't play with matches and the secret message is how you give a child a lifelong fear of fire. <laughs> In our number one spot today we have the story of little suck a thumb. This story starts off with the mom leaving her young son Conrad at home. She explains that she needs to leave for a little while but warns him not to suck his thumb while she is away or else. She says that the great tall tailor always finds little boys who suck their thumbs and takes big sharp scissors and cuts them off and explains that thumbs can't grow back. The mom leaves and then almost immediately after the boy begins sucking his thumb. He had been warned but absolutely did not listen. Soon the door flew open and a tailor began running in with scissors. I'm not sure why the tailor cares so much about it but he ends up chasing the boy around and snipping off his thumbs. When the mom comes home she sees the boy standing there and apparently he just looks sad. I feel like I would be a lot more than sad if somebody cut off my thumbs but I guess it is just a story. The mom then says she knew that the tailor would come to naughty little suck a thumb, which seems like kind of an insensitive response. Starting off in our number 10 spot. In the small town of Salkia in 1992, a police officer was getting off of his long shift around midnight. He was ready to head home after a long day and exited the police station to see his driver sitting there waiting for him. He got into the passenger side front seat and the two began their drive home. The roads were very empty this night and there were barely any other people around, but suddenly they saw a human 
figure in the distance that ended up being a woman who was asking for help. The two stopped the car and the police officer asked if she needed a ride. The driver was very superstitious and wasn't comfortable with the woman entering the car, but he figured that if he didn't look at her and with the police officer there that everything should be fine. The police officer had a hard time seeing her clearly because it was dark, but the most noticeable thing about her was her beautiful sparkling red sari and all of her amazing gold jewelry. They asked where she was going to and the woman explained that she was trying to get to the nearby temple. As they drove on, the police officer began to doze off since he was so tired from his long shift, but was suddenly awoken by the screeching from the brakes of the car. When he opened his eyes, he realized that they had arrived at the temple and the driver asked the police officer if he could let the woman know that they had arrived. But when the police officer turned around, there was no one in the back seat and all the windows were closed with the car doors locked from inside. In at number nine, we have Manachua. But if you guys are liking this video so far, then come on, you guys know the drill. Make sure to give it a big thumbs up because it really helps us out. In India, the Manachua is known as a light emitting entity. Or as its name translates to, it's also known as the face scratcher. Now this story all started off as a tale to scare children, until in 2002 when it seemed to come to life. During this time, several villagers reported seeing a UFO beam of light. When they got close to it, it scratched them. Others were left with bruises on their face and arms. Some say it felt like a hawk-like metal claw on their skin. People were so spooked that temples held prayers, while other villagers stayed up at night around bonfires with weapons, just waiting for it. Now, the stories of the face scratcher are continually shared. To this day, they don't know exactly what happened back in 2002. In our number eight spot, we have the story of the town of Kuldera. This town has been abandoned since 1825, and no one really knows why, but there are some theories. There are structures in the village that date all the way back to the 13th century when it was once a very lively village. Local lore says that 1,000 people who lived in the village just vanished into thin air one day. There is no one who knows why they left and where they all ended up, and some of the theories start with people believing that the wells were poisoned. Others believe that a ruler was raising the taxes for the diminishing water supply, but this still doesn't explain how everyone just vanished. One night, the Indian Paranormal Society spent a night there and reported a ton of paranormal activity, such as disembodied whispers, screams, and other noises. No one has ever tried to settle there since its abandonment because there is a legend that the village chief cursed the land, and if you try and live there, you will die. In our number six spot today, we have the story of Dr. L. Mm. Dr. L was a doctor in a small town in South India, and one night after closing up his clinic, he was asleep at home. There was a knock on his door, and when when the doctor's grandmother opened it, she saw a man who explained that his wife, who was pregnant, desperately needed the doctor's help. The grandmother didn't want to wake Dr. L, but the man was very persistent. When Dr. L woke up, he packed his medical bag and headed off with the stranger. There weren't a lot of streetlights in the area, so it was fairly dark as Dr. L followed this man home. The man kept apologizing for waking up the doctor, but explained that he had no other choice. When the stranger went to head through a graveyard, Dr. L understandably hesitated, but also ultimately followed him through. In the graveyard, the two approached a lamppost that gave Dr. L a much better view of this stranger, and this is when he realized that the stranger had no face, and he was just clothes hanging in the air. He of course freaked out and said that he had forgotten some equipment and needed to go home to get it. Luckily, Dr. L was able to make it home, very frightened, but safe. The next day, Dr. L went to the mayor's office to try and explain to him why he should be installing more streetlights without giving away exactly what he had seen the night before. After vaguely explaining the story to the mayor, the mayor then explained how lucky the doctor was because there had been three doctors who previously went missing under those exact same circumstances. They got lured out at night by an emergency and were never seen again. Who was this invisible ghost? We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Malcha Mahal. Legend goes that this place is haunted. 
there have been a number of stories of people going in and never making it out alive. Especially a number of journalists went missing exploring this place. Now according to local legend, the Malsha Mahal was given to Princess Mahal by the government. She lived there with her two kids and dogs. Yet the place was run down, infested with bugs, and had no running water or electricity. How they managed to survive in there, isolated from others, still remains a mystery. But eventually the princess couldn't take living there anymore and took her own life. She did this by swallowing crushed diamonds. Her kids went on living without her. They would only wear black robes and could be seen occasionally going out to get food or supplies. In fact, for several years, the place was guarded and any trespassers would be shot down. After their death, the palace was open to the public and is now said to be haunted by the souls that died there. So be careful. You may enter the place no problem, but you may not make it out alive. In our number four spot, we have this story about a writer. A writer decided to move into his grandparents' house a few years after they had passed in order to have some time alone and be able to get some writing done. The house was a huge but very old mansion, and it certainly needed more people tending to it than just this one man, and he found himself so distracted by the repairs that the house needed, so he began to go on walks to try and get his writing ideas flowing. His favorite route took him through the edge of the forest and then out to a country road Road that landed right in the middle of two cemeteries. When he continued on this country road, it would take him to a little town where he could get food and drinks, but at night he said the town had a strange feeling, like he should avoid it. One night the writer couldn't sleep around 2am so he decided to take his walk. It had rained and the smell of the fresh earth was very invigorating and he ended up getting caught up in his own thoughts instead of being on the lookout. He should have realized that there were no sounds of birds or insects or any kind of animal, but he was totally distracted. When he got to the country road, he was almost at the little town when he thought that he should head back home. This is when he saw a lantern bobbing up and down and decided to let the man who was holding it fall into step with him. The writer had a flashlight on, so the man put out his lantern, but the writer wasn't exactly sure if he could see the man, although he could definitely hear him. The two struck up a conversation, but eventually the writer began to get a bad feeling. He stopped to light a cigarette, and he realized he couldn't hear the other man's footsteps. The writer asked if the man was okay, and the man replied, You have narrowly escaped. The writer sprinted back to his house where he was finally safe. When he told the story to other people in the town, they explained that it must have been an apparition. Since they are repelled by warmth and light, the fact that he lit his cigarette might have saved him that night. In our third spot, we have the Lady in White. Sanjay Van is a beautiful but haunted city forest area in Delhi, India. Among the wildlife and nature, apparently there are a lot of ghosts that like to lurk there. In particular, a lady in white. On a bunch of different occasions, a number of visitors have seen this lady. Story goes that she likes to stand and just stare at people passing by. But it doesn't seem like she wants to cause harm, so that's good. She's not the only ghost in that area though. Others have heard ghostly sounds of a baby crying and a girl laughing. Others have felt like they were being watched or even have felt a cold presence by them. It's believed that this area is haunted because there's a bunch of unmarked grave sites in that area. In fact, stories of the area spook so many people that there's actually a notice board there that warns people not to stay there after dark. In our number two spot today, we have the story of the Morgan House. The Morgan House is a very popular tourist development in Kalimpong. Its beauty draws a lot of people to the present day Heritage Hotel. Back in its day, it used to see a lot of large, elegant parties since the beautiful wood and stone structures are the perfect backdrop. But it is now known as a haunted hotel. It is said that the spirit of Lady Morgan never left the house. It was built specifically for Lady Morgan and her husband to get married, but after she died a premature death, Mr. Morgan had to leave the house. The story goes that Lady Morgan was actually tortured by her husband before her death, so it is said that her ghost is rightfully very unhappy. People have reported being able to hear high-heeled shoes tapping in the corridor when no one is around. And in our number one spot, we have Duma's Beach. This is said to be one of the most haunted places in India. Story goes that the black sand beach was an ancient burial ground, and so spirits still roam there throughout the day, and especially during the night. 
In fact, it's believed that the sand on the beach is black because of the amount of ash created by burning the dead there. The ash then mixed with the white sand and turned the whole beach dark, meaning that a lot of bodies got burned and buried there. One story of the area that's really creepy is this one. One day a group of friends went to the beach at night to see if it truly was haunted. The whole time while they were there, they felt like something was watching them and they got really creeped out. So they took a bunch of photos and then left. Upon reviewing the photos, they realized that they captured tons of orbs. And in one photo, they captured a shadowy figure right behind one of the friends.